we all have family, and we're dealing with family in all sorts of different ways. There's uh, no way around it. Some of us are embracing our families, some of, some of us are avoiding our families, some of are avoiding parts of our families. And usually we th think about our families in terms of mums, dads, sisters, brothers, aunts, uncles, grandparents, great-grandparents. Um, some of us have extended families, so you, uh, modern families, you do, you have all sorts of combinations of, uh, of family, family patterns, but that's the way we usually think about uh, family. And you, quite often, that's quite enough when you think uh, about, uh, about your own family, when you talk about uh, your own family. But this evening, I'm going to talk about uh, our family, the family that we all share, our truly extended family that includes lots and lots of living primates, um, but also a lot of dead ancestors. I'm going to talk about uh, the last six or seven million years of history in about uh, 45 minutes or so <laughs> of your immediate family. And when you ask a question how to deal with your extended evolutionary family, you can do it in lots of different ways. So much is happening in human evolutionary studies these, uh, these, day, these days. Almost every single week we have a new and exciting uh, story breaking, breaking the news of something new that we've figured out uh, that will change some bits and pieces of uh, the big picture that we all know. And I can tell you that uh, also this week there'll be a new story. Can't tell you what it is yet. You'll just have to watch the news. And I've spent the entire evening talking about all of these breakthroughs uh, that we've, uh, we've seen, and some, picking some of the highlights uh, of our recent developments in human evolution. Or you could take a different, you could take a different perspective or a different take on how we are dealing with, uh, with human evolution. And uh, I've decided for, for the latter. And you're perfectly welcome to ask me any questions about human evolution in the bar afterwards. The first thing is, for this, you'll have to use your imagination, unfortunately. It's, uh, it's the favorite pic uh, photograph of me, um, my favorite photograph of, uh, of me. Not because of me, but because what you should be seeing down here is the mirror image of a chimpanzee, a fellow ape, our um, closely related cousin, our evolutionary cousin. We share 98.7% of our genes with chimpanzees. So it's our closest living relative, the chimpanzees, and the bonobos, very similar to chimpanzees in most ways, but uh, they're often forgotten. But chimpanzees and bonobos, they're our clo most closely related uh, cousins. This should convincingly demonstrate you what happens if you switch the image and uh, what instead comes up at the top is uh, the chimpanzee. So taking the chimp's perspective on, uh, on, on our relationship, unfortunately you can't really see it on the screen, we tested it uh, uh, beforehand. So, but this is what, uh, what I'll start out with, looking at uh, things from a chimp perspective and looking at, uh, at how we are dealing with our closest living relative. For those of you who speak Danish, I have written a small book, and that's true. It's 60 pages, 7 million years and 60 pages, so, and you can put it in your, in your pockets and read it on, uh, on the tube if, uh, if you like. It's called Family, and it's, it is about our extended, uh, human, uh, our, extended human, uh, our extended evolutionary family. The publisher is preparing an English edition. Uh, I don't know when that will be out uh, yet. Anyway. Onto the story. We share a lot of different things with chimpanzees. We share our, uh, a lot of our genes with, uh, with chimps, but we also share a lot of our behavior. Chimps have babies, just like we do. Chimps take care of their babies, just like we do. They take care of 
their babies for ex an extended amount of time compared to uh, non-primates. And they care for their babies. They have a close bond between mother and baby that will last for, uh, for the entire life of, uh, of the chimpanzees. They get traumatized if you take the baby from a chimpanzee. The mother will be traumatized, the baby will be traumatized, and that will be a trauma that will last a lifetime. We also share a number of other things, curious things with, uh, with the chimpanzees. And for this, I'd like you to, uh, I'd like to conduct an experiment. This is a science session, so it's, uh, you should all be, have a scientific mind, I'm, uh, I'm sure, and uh, wouldn't mind uh, participating in this, uh, in this experiment. I'd like you to raise your left arm, all of you, and then with your right hand, form a C, put it in front of your body, and then move it next door to your neighbor, and hold it right there, <laughs> and don't touch, but just hold it, don't touch, and on the count of three, you do this. Okay? One, two, three. <laughs> Isn't it amazing? What happens? My, yes. It'll not be not, not a surprise that uh, my prediction came true. You all started laughing. Most of you, well, a, bit, a few tough nails who tried not to laugh, and you started laughing already before because you were anticipating, well, now you know what's going to happen. But initially you think, okay, well, so what kind of weird experiment is he doing? But then you realize, oh no, this is a tickle experiment. And before the actual tickling started, he started laughing. And you really enjoyed it. We do. Humans love to laugh. And you know what? Chimps, they do the same. And they really like grooming. Do you see this image? It's a wonderful uh, family photo. Uh, four chimpanzees sitting together in, uh, in Kibala National Forest, uh, grooming each other, and they really like it. Chimps and chimps, they love to be tickled. Bonobos, they love to be tickled, and they laugh. They have a very distinct laughter. The bonobo's laughter is slightly different from the chimpanzees. Gorillas, they love to be tickled as well. Their laughter is also slightly different from, uh, from chimps and bonobos. Orangutans, they also like to be tickled. Isn't it curious? All the great apes, including us, we love to be tickled. It's part of our nature, and we laugh, and we enjoy it. It's part of our interaction. Some researchers, they thought, well, this is really curious. What happens if we record the sounds and get a reading of the sounds and see and to look at the patterns of, uh, of the sounds? How do, they, how, do they, how do they look compared to each other? And when doing that, they realized that it actually it matches how closely we are related. So the laughter between humans and chimpanzees bonobos is closer than the laughter between, the, the pattern from the laughter between humans and orangutans. Which made the researchers suggest that our common ancestors, the common ancestors of orangutans, gorillas, chimps and bonobos and humans probably also like to be, to be tickled. We can go into the uh, evolutionary causes of why we like to be to be tickled. It's clearly it's part of uh, it's it's a bonding thing, and it's a grooming thing. And we like to groom each other. We don't call it, call it grooming, but we really we, when we sit next next to each other, we like to touch each other. And in 
in, in friendly ways, and uh, we do that in, on the couch uh, and the sofa, in all sorts of, uh, in all sorts of different, different ways. And it's a perfectly natural thing. We do that. It's an ape thing. We just like it. It's part of what we do. Could we dim the lights, please? This is one image that I would really like you to, to, to get a closer look at. Well, it's difficult for you to see. I would, I would want you to see if you could see something special about this chimp. But I don't think you can make it out on, uh, on the screen. Anyway, he's sitting in the tree and he's, he's watching me. I'm standing in, uh, in, in a forest in, uh, in Uganda. And he's just sitting there looking at me. I'm looking at him like apes do. We do that all the time. Look at each other, check each other out. There's something special about it, about him. He's lost his hand. And he's lost his hand to snares. This is one of the big, of, of the big problems in, uh, in Uganda and in most of the places where we find chimpanzees, that the f people are using the forests as a natural resource. People have been doing that for thousands and thousands of years. That is not, a, that's not a, a, a new thing. But nowadays, we have uh, endangered animals living in these, uh, in these forests. And the pressures of the people living in the forested areas uh, is, is growing. The population is growing in Uganda, for instance, uh, which brings a lot of people on the verge of uh, desperation for getting, getting meat and getting things to eat. Also, um, in, uh, in, in some, among some people, uh, the meat that you get in, uh, in these forests, bush meat, is considered a special delicacy. So you go out and you hunt for, uh, for um, you hunt for meat in, in the forests. I've put up a selection of uh, four different kinds of snares. You see the big one over here. This is an elephant snare. That's also used for, uh, for elephants. The ones the next door is, is a rope. And then you have possibly the most efficient snare to catch prey in, uh, in the forest um, is made out of wires from motorcycles. It's extremely cheap, very easy to, to get by, but it's also incredibly efficient. As uh, if, if when the, an animal is caught, it's absolutely impossible for the animal to get out. It's also impossible for the chimps to get out. The only way the chimps they can get out of a snare is by either ripping up the, uh, the, the tree, if it's a tree that uh, the snare is attached to, or it is by ripping off its own limbs. And this happens all the time. Um, in my previous job, before I became a museum director, uh, I was working happily directing uh, a research center for uh, what we call biocultural history. And one of our projects, in, and, it was, and that was in, at Aarhus University, one of our projects was looking at the effects of long-term primatological research and conservation in African forests. And part of that project was looking into, uh, into how we uh, study long-term research, effects of long-term research in Kibale National Forest in, uh, in Uganda. It's a wonderful place. We have one of the highest con concentrations of primates in, uh, in Africa, 13. It's matched by Utsungba. Uh, mountains in uh, in Tanzania, and we have uh, and we have our chimps that we that we looked looked at. Here I am sitting in the field. A few of my cousins uh, sitting a, a bit further down uh, down the road. Lots of primates, baboons, red colobus, um, black and white colobus. Um, and part of the research, 
project in the field station down there is to uh, set up a snare removal program to go out in the forest and remove, to try to keep up with the, with the poachers and removing as many snares as, uh, as, as we can. And here we have some of the, some of the rangers and uh, my wonderful postdoc, Jess Hartle, who unfortunately left me when I went to Copenhagen and she went back to the, uh, back to the States. But she's still running the, uh, the snare removal program and doing a lot of good things in Uganda. In fact, she's in Uganda uh, as we speak. I've taken a picture of, uh, of a snare. The image is possibly difficult for you to make, uh, to make out, uh, all of you sitting, uh, sitting there. But do you, any of you have a guess of where you, you'd find the snare? There's a snare in this picture. It's incredibly difficult to spot. I see some of you are pointing it to it, to something happening over here, where you see three vertical lines going down. The snare is put between sticks that are put down into, into the ground, and it's, it's made a loop, and what... And you see on this image how it's set up, and what happens is the animal puts his, its hand or foot through the loop and then continues running and it tightens. And the more it pulls, the more it tightens. It's super simple and impossible to, uh, to get out of. Here you see a red diker that is caught in the, and here you see, here's how this, the, this, this snare has been made, how the diker is caught the, um, the snare around its, its head, but you don't check on your snares every single day. So it happens that animals are, get, are caught in the forest and sit there, for instance, for a week. Some, they, well, they usually die before that, as uh, has happened for this uh, diker who put up uh, quite a big fight. Um, but even though the snares there are intended for ungulates, uh, they also capture other animals like uh, this uh, golden cat. What's an ungulate? Like dikers, deers, etc. Those kind of, and they, there are lots of, uh, of small ungulates, small, lots of small deer uh, in the. Uh, in, in the forest, this, and this is, uh, what, this is what people they go for. They don't go, f go for um, predatory cats, they don't go, for, don't go for elephants, but often you see elephants, they get their trunks uh, in, in these snares. And you, you'll see, I have a video, I wonder if it'll play. can't get it to work. Anyway, here you see an elephant that is also, uh, that has been caught by a snare and its, its trunk is cut in, uh, in half and it's trying to, to survive with the, with the trunk cut in half. This happens a lot of the time. Usually these accidents with the elephant, they don't, you don't put up a snare like that in order to, to, uh, to catch an elephant. You do something differently. You do something like this, which is covering up a big hole with spikes coming up, you see he's climbing up a uh, spike there. The elephants, they drop down into the hole and is caught there. What is collected by the poachers, uh, uh, that's the, the ivory, and usually the, the rest of the elephant is left in the, in the forest to, to rot or it's, uh, it's being tracked down by some of the locals and it's used for, uh, for bush meat. A lot of different animals are used for bush meat in, uh, in Kibali. There's a ban against eating primates in uh, Uganda. You, that's, you don't do that. But we see that people are coming in possibly from Rwanda where they don't have uh, a ban against, uh, a ban against eating primates. And we've had a few examples of, uh, of some primates that has been uh, 
that has been eaten. But what happens with the chimpanzees when we return to, to them is that they lose their limbs. As you can see, the guy on the left has lost both of his feet. This chap has lost both hands. Imagine that, and he's, as you can see, he's grown to, to a bipedal behavior. Imagine that, being a chimpanzee and trying to survive in the forest with no hands, that is a bit of a, bit of a challenge. Sometimes we get lucky and, uh, and, and capture some of the chimps that uh, have been uh, snared. This is a wonderful story of, uh, of a chimpanzee. You can see how severed the, uh, the, arm, uh, the arm is. Um, she was captured, stitched back together, and uh, a few years later, she, uh, she got a baby, and she's now uh, and, and survived. And going back to babies, one of, the, one of the things that you see instantly when you go to, uh, to watch chimps in the wild is that they are incredibly playful. Human children are incredibly playful as well, but there's a difference in chimpanzees and in, uh, in human babies. The chimps, they're up and about very early on. They can go ahead on their own uh, from a very young age. They can climb trees, they can act independently, they can uh, get their own food, even though they still depend a lot on their mother, even though they still get milk from, uh, from their mother, even though their mother still carries the baby when, uh, when he or she is, uh, is, she is tired. From a very early age, they can, climb, uh, they can climb trees and they can do all sorts of wonderful things that we can't. And one of the reasons why we can't do that is because of a particularly a particular problem, but also a wonderful thing. <coughs> this is Anna. This is uh, my cousin's young daughter, and she is sitting, as you can see, very happily, about uh, on uh, her father's arm. She enjoys herself already, even though she's just a few weeks old. Um, she feels perfectly safe sitting on, uh, on, on daddy's arm. But you can also see something differently when you look at uh, the young chimp that, and compare the, the young chimp that we had uh, in the image just before and, uh, and Anna. Anna's got a very big brain. Usually we think, big brains, they're great, we can do all sorts of things. We can, uh, we can go to listen to science talks, etc. Um, we can even go on uh, YouTube and watch funny videos of cats dressed up. All sorts of amazing things we can use our brain to, isn't it, isn't it great? But the big, the big brain is also a problem. It's a problem because it's incredibly expensive. And it's expensive in all sorts of ways. We use a lot of our energy, about 20% of our energy goes straight to the brain. It's an incredibly expensive organ to, to use. Anna, she's using about 40% of her, of her energy just to run her, her big brain. Uh, that is incredibly expensive. Imagine all the energy you need to, to get just to run that, uh, that one single organ that compared to the rest of your body uh, is actually pretty, pretty small. It's also expensive for the mother. It's comparatively rather dangerous to have human babies. And it's very complicated. You need to, for the baby to get out of the womb, you need to twist and turn, and it's painful. And uh, when the baby is born, it can do absolutely nothing for a very long time. And you need to take care of it. You need to feed it. You need to feed it milk. And even after you've, uh, you've stopped feeding it milk, you'd have to keep feeding it. It will take years and years uh, for it to, uh, to be able to take care of itself. I'm a father of uh, three children, 11, 17, 21. I can tell you from personal experience, it takes a while before they can take care of themselves. I'm sure my parents, they will say the same. And I'm sure a lot of you have similar uh, experiences. And that is just a fact. Keeping, bringing human children up is incredibly expensive. It costs a lot of money. For us, when we're going back in time, it costs a lot of effort. It costs a lot of time. It costs a lot of, a lot, a lot of food. 
So why is it that we have these, uh, these big brains? What was the use of it? And has, and has that changed? Usually we, we thought that humans were the most wonderful, clever animals in, uh, that had ever lived, the, the biggest brains uh, ever. Now we know that that's not uh, entirely correct. Neanderthals, for instance, they had bigger brains than humans, our closest extinct relatives. And when we look at our own brains, they've also changed. They've changed fairly recently, actually. During the past 10,000 years, our brains have grown smaller. Why is that? Aren't we getting just more and more clever? And aren't we just getting a lot? Well, we know at least we're, more, we're cleverer than our parents. And of course, we're cleverer than they were 100 years ago. And definitely 1,000 years, and definitely 10,000 years ago, we have to be a lot cleverer. And yet, our brains have grown smaller over the course of 10,000 years. Why is that? Well, one explanation uh, that has been proposed recently is that when you look at, at domesticated species, like our pets, for instance, dogs, cats, their brains have also grown. When, they, when they're being domesticated, their brains shrink. So this is a pattern that we see in a lot of domesticated animals. So perhaps what has happened is that we've domesticated ourselves and we've turned into domesticated animals. And domesticated animals, well, they don't need big brains. Big brains, they're incredibly, uh, incredibly expensive. And if we have someone taking care of uh, all the safety issues that uh, we usually have to, th to think about. Growing up, for instance, in the rainforest, well, that's just pretty dangerous. So there's a lot of things that you need to, to think about all the, uh, all the time. But if you're growing up in a, in a domesticated setting, well, you don't need to be on high alert all the time, so you don't need to spend as much energy on uh, feeding, uh, feeding your brain. So that's one hypothesis of, uh, of why our brains have uh, gotten smaller. We also usually think that we must be best at absolutely everything. In the 1950s, everybody thought that what made us special, what made humans special, was that we were tool users, that we were able to, to make tools and use tools, and our ancestor would be, the, the first human would be the first tool user. Homo habilis was uh, found in, uh, in, in Africa and uh, was named Homo habilis because he was supposed to be the first tool user, and the first tool maker. Now we know that a lot of different animals are using tools. Chimps use tools, uh, a lot of different primates use tools, even some birds use tools. We have even uh, doc documented that some fish are also using tools, so that doesn't really make us special. Also, when we look at things that we can do with our brain, mm, some things are, uh, we, we don't always match up. You all know the game Memory, right? Where you have uh, a deck of uh, similar looking pieces, and uh, two of them are identical, and then you turn them over and you see, oh, there's a chimp on this, and you turn the oh, a chicken, <coughs> fail and uh, you need to match the chimp and the chimp, the chicken and the chicken, etc. We are unable to beat chimpanzees in the game of memory. <laughs> Can't do it. You're perfectly welcome to try. Researchers in, uh, in Japan, they try that consistently, and none of them, all of them PhDs, no one could beat the chimps. They're just absolutely spectacular at, uh, in a game of memory. So if a chimp ever challenges you to a game of memory, don't put money on the table. Don't do it. <laughs> One thing that makes us different from all other animals, as far as we know, is that we have a special uh, ability to look at ourselves from the outside, literally. This is a picture from space. Tracy Caldwell Dyson uh, looking down on, uh, on, on Earth. We can do that. And we can see not just the entire world in, uh, in itself, but we can also see the consequences of what we're doing to, uh, to our planet. We can see the consequences of our action, and we can think about them. And that's one of the things when we see images like uh, what we're doing to our closest living relatives. We need to think about it. We can, we can think about it, and we can act 
on the, we can act on it. And if we don't act, our closest living relatives, the chimps and the bonobos, they will be gone. They will disappear, and the, it'll it'll happen very fast if we don't take uh, take care of our closest evolutionary family. And then it'll not be the chimps that are our closest living re living relatives. When we look at our extended evolutionary family from a different perspective, uh, we can also we can ask a question: What do people see? And usually, what they see is this image. It's very well known. It's from and in this case, it's uh, uh, tiny tiny figures familiar with uh, the amoeba, the ape that is eventually ending up in the in the wonderful conclusion of the usually in this case. Not in this case, but in this case, the genius. This playset is called From Fish to Genius in uh, 340 Million Years. This is the usual image that we see, and it's very uh, widespread. It's unfortunate, it's also it's, uh, it's a wrong image of, uh, of human evolution. Human evolution is not a linear progress towards the perfect European male. I'm sorry to say so. If there should be any of any perfect European males in that sort, it, no, it's it's this is not how it, how it works. We've looked at uh, at what, how people think at, think about uh, human evolution, and consistently all over the world, except for India, for uh, for some reason, this is the image that uh, props up uh, this linear image in uh, in all in all Google searches in all uh, in all languages. But we need to, to work against it and uh, instead think about, uh, about evolution not as uh, progression uh, towards perfection, but as uh, common descent. And this is one of the basic things about, uh, about human evolution. To Darwin, who, uh, and this would not be a surprise to anyone, I'm sure, was uh, also pondering the question about human evolution. There were four different key moments in human evolution. It was down from the trees, up on two legs, growing a big brain, and starting civilization. Some colleagues and I, we've looked at, uh, at uh, what is the status of, uh, of Darwin's key moments in, uh, in human evolution. And even though we still think that uh, these are a key moments, a lot of things have happened since, uh, since Darwin. This is, this is not least because of what we could call the fossil explosion. We have discovered an incredibly amount of, uh, of, of fossils. Initially, at the, begin, the, the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century, there were very few fossils around. But in the past 15 to 20 years, we've, we've found so many new fossils that we are able to draw up the, our family tree in a completely different way. We also have lots of archaeological evidence to, to support uh, this incredibly complicated uh, puzzle that our family history is. And we look at um, indigenous peoples around the world to, uh, to, to look at traits of behavior, for instance, in human gatherers. They are, fewer and fewer groups of uh, hunter-gatherers uh, around, but we use that information of how they live, how they forage, uh, their behavior, to make models of uh, our, our ancestors, ancestors. And we look at contemporary populations, like this one, for instance, look at the genetic composition of, uh, of contemporary populations in order to, to get an idea of, uh, of uh, uh, our ancestral history. And we're doing all that to build evolutionary trees. Here you see one, uh, one evolutionary tree which maps us, our history, our evolutionary history to uh, the other uh, great apes. And as you can see in this, in this study, it's, uh, we have 
um, a breaking point with the last common ancestors between chimpanzees and bonobos on the one side and humans on the other side, sometime between four and six, four to seven million years ago. So, and usually we, th we, we say that it's possibly, it's, it's something that happened between five and seven million years ago. The, the, last, that the last common ancestors between chimpanzees and bonobos and humans and uh, uh, that, uh, that they lived. Those on our branch, the human branch, we call hominins. And there are quite a, there are quite a lot of them, and uh, they have been growing in number over the past hundred uh, hundred years. This is one way of trying to map our genetic evidence and uh, our fossil evidence together uh, to make the big picture of uh, human evolution. But it's curious if I was to give a, this talk about. 10 years ago, I would be far more confident in saying, this is how it looks. This is our family tree. This is when this species branched out. And this is the route to us modern humans. We know far more today than we did 10 years ago. A lot of things have happened in, uh, in genetic studies. ADNA, we, know, we have far more fossils. Uh, we have new ways of, uh, of looking at data, and we're mapping all of these things on top of each other. But the curious thing is that what we get is a story that is far more messy, far more complicated, far more complex than any of us have, uh, have thought. For instance, and some of you may have, uh, have heard this, um, we've had interspecies sex between Homo sapiens and Neanderthals. Ten years ago, nobody, nobody but uh, fiction writers would believe that. But now, today, we know that this is a true fact, and it happened several times. It was not just a one-off between a Homo sapiens and a Neanderthal. It happens several times. It happens with other species, um, species called Denisovans. And we see that this is a pattern that uh, people, they have intermixed, and every time people they meet, their sex, this is just something that happens every time species or individuals they, they meet, this is, this is what happens. It's also another thing, lastly, uh, an African story. And generally speaking, we're still a tropical ape that is just living slightly off our uh, natural environment. But we have, we have perfectly uh, adapted to different environments. And this is one of the reasons why we've, uh, we've been able to colonize the, uh, the, entire, uh, the entire planet. This is uh, most of the, uh, of the African species that, uh, that we know. Homo erectus is, is a particular favorite of, uh, of mine. Homo erectus is, as far as we know, the first hominin that left the African continent, and it did so about 1.8 million years ago, far earlier than Homo sapiens left uh, the African continent. Homo sapiens evolved about 200, 250,000 years ago. Just a few years ago, we thought that uh, Homo sapiens left the African continent 60 to 70,000 years ago. But then we found uh, evidence of, uh, of Homo sapiens presence in, uh, in China dating to 80,000 to 120,000 years ago. So maybe they left uh, earlier. Maybe they dif did that on uh, several different times, uh, different, several different times. Um, but what we know is that uh, Homo erectus was incredibly successful, possibly the most successful hominin that had uh, ever existed, far more successful than us. We've only been here for a very short time. But Homo erectus uh, was uh, lived for perhaps uh, 1.7 million years ago, which is a pretty good run for a, for a, for a hominin. And it spread up into Europe, into uh, Southeast uh, Afri Africa. Um, and even down on the Indonesian islands, as, uh, as you can see. So one of our really successful ancestors. This is uh, some maps of, uh, the, of our own species colonization of, uh, of the world. And what is happening, this is, uh, this is a, a study from uh, 2013. 
and we're already revising these uh, these dates. So this is, uh, and sometimes I get the question: so isn't that really frustrating that you need to revise these data all the time? But this is actually this is what makes it so wonderful that uh, we learn new things uh, all all the time, and that we that we use all that uh, that knowledge to keep, to make a more precise picture of who we are and uh, and where we came from. When people had travelled around the world, they also saw a lot of that people they looked uh, they, they looked differently. Racial stereotypical uh, images was widespread, and to some extent. It's, it still is. It's been one of those concepts that has been most difficult to uh, to to shake off. Um, we've even had uh, people who've made uh, scales of uh, the different colours of uh, of how humans uh, how humans looked, put them on the on the map. All done very scientifically, of course. <laughs> also uh, created evolutionary maps. Um, of um, mapping Europeans with and Africans and Asian populations, uh, different ancestral apes that were groups, and of course the European. In this case, the European ape ancestral ape was undiscovered, but of course of a far more noble character <laughs> than uh, the rest of the apes. All of this, of course, is nonsense. And one of the things, if you take the plane, that you'll, you'll know, if you take the plane from uh, Denmark and you fly down to Kenya, for instance, take uh, the trip down, you see that people are looking differently. However, if you go on your bike and you take a wonderful trip through Ukraine, Georgia, Israel, uh, all the way down, it's impossible to see when it actually changes. When does one race begin, when do, you, do the other race uh, differ? <coughs> this wonderful picture has something special about it, these two, these two girls. Does anyone know what, what that is? <laughs> They're twins, exactly. And this is, this is something that you, most people think would be unexpected. It is possible, and it happens uh, there's a one in a million chance for for something like this to uh, to happen, but it uh, but it does, and it it tells you one of the one of the biological one of the important biological points we get from genetics and also from looking at our at our uh, history and our collectors uh, family uh, family history that a lot of it is based on uh, on prejudice. When we look at our, ourselves, when we look at our family, well, we know a lot is based on, uh, on informed prejudice. When we look a bit further in our family, uh, in our family tree, in our contemporary family tree, in this human family, a lot of it is based on, uh, on prejudice. When we look back into our, into our, uh, our evolutionary past, even more is, uh, is based on prejudice. One of the prejudices is that we are somehow superior. I am somehow superior. Our tiny local group is somehow superior. This is a very good survival thing. It's a very good survival instinct. We see that in chimpanzees, for instance, that they are very good at protecting their own group. Chimps, they fight each other in, uh, between groups. We have some people, they even call it warfare between, uh, between different, uh, between different uh, groups of chimpanzees. We have males who come in and, uh, and attack one group of, uh, of chimpanzees. Very aggressive behavior. They, if they can get away with it, they'll kill the other males and uh, they'll, uh, they'll keep the females. And obviously they'll mate with the, with the females and start, and start uh, a, new, a new group. We see that in chimps, we see that in, lot, in a lot of different uh, species. So it's a natural thing, but it's also a thing when we are so many people, not just in this room, but when we're so many people on the planet and we are getting more and more people, quite a lot more people, actually, um, we're putting a lot of pressure on, uh, on the planet, we're putting a lot of pressure on the natural habitat, we're put, putting a lot of pressure on uh, quite a lot of different species. But we have the ability 
to think about the consequences of our actions. We have the ability to think and take care of not just our own family, but also our extended, extended evolutionary family, our living, our closest living relatives, and everybody uh, and everybody else on this on this planet. And at a point of time, when many scientists agree that we are equivalent to a geological force, that what we do to the planet is something that we will see in the geological records in, uh, in, uh, in future generations. We need to use that power to think about what we're doing to the planet. We need to use that power to think what we're doing to our closest li living relatives and to everybody else on, uh, on the planet. And I think this is tonight's most important message. There's a lot more to our, uh, to our wonderful, uh, big, uh, complicated uh, family story. But using our great, wonderful, expensive brain to take care of your family, I think. That's this evening's most important message. Thank you.